Thank you for inviting me. Uh, when I talked to Bill about this, uh, I said, what is the deal with the session, water wells? It sounds very strange to me, that combination of terms. And then he explained it's on the sign here in Modesto. So there's the sign. Um, and uh, well, I'll see what I can contribute as a philosopher. And basically what I want to try to do is um, talk about the difficulty of thinking about the justice issues involved and ethical issues and political issues in terms of, I guess, distributing these things and even understanding how they, um, how they function in our world. Just by way of introduction, uh, just to sort of tell you what's been going on down in Fresno. And I, my colleagues uh, from Fresno State are talking after this session on a, a religious pluralism project we have going on in Fresno. I've been involved with that uh, and some other stuff. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered through the philosophy department at Fresno State is that philosophers can actually engage the real world um, <laughs> if we just leave our offices on occasion. So we've gone out and we've actually worked with religious communities and interfaith community and human rights community. And we've done a lot of work in the community um, through the ethics centers, especially at Fresno State. And my, that picture on the upper left, that's me getting an award from the local mosque. And I think I may be the only atheist who's gotten an award from a mosque. So I take that as a point of pride. <laughs> Um, anyway, just to give you a little idea of where we're coming from on this. Um, so what I, uh, what I would like to do just in my 15 minutes is talk about the depth of our disagreements. And uh, if you've lived here for even a little while, you realize there are deep political disagreements here in the Central Valley. Um, I want to talk about how civility and justice may work to heal that, maybe. Um, and then finally, what is the role of philosophy and what, are the, what is the role in the humanities in terms of the conflicts and the diversity that we discover here? Here's another version of your, uh, your town symbol. Um, and I, what I like about the fact that there are two different versions of this, there's competing visions of what this world is all about. And if you've lived here long enough, you get it. There are big, big disagreements about each of those things, water, wells, contentment, health, and so on. Uh, there simply is no agreement. Uh, maybe there's a common framework, but uh, even then, that's contested. So when I was here uh, last time, I talked about a couple of these. The, the images represent a couple of things that we talked about. Uh, the upper right-hand uh, uh, image is the question of water, which is hugely contested. Uh, when you see, drive around the valley and you see these signs, is growing food a waste of water? Uh, the farmers have one opinion. The environmentalists have a different opinion. They don't agree. I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, the Chuck Chansey, this is our local tribe down in Fresno. There was a tribal dispute. I talked about this when I was here last time. There was a tribal dispute involving the money that the tribe is making through the casino. And there was a big issue about who belongs to the tribe. The enrollment question of who belongs and who gets the money seriously contested up to the point that guns were drawn in the casino. I don't know if the news made it up this far, uh, but folks, armed folks showed up at the casino and then the casino has now been put out of business by the federal authorities for a couple years. Um, at the lower uh, right-hand corner, this is that uh, book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, which involves disparities and misunderstandings with regard to culture and health out of Merced and so on. The data here is the 2016 Forbes magazine list of the best and worst places to do business in the United States. And look at our valley cities. Out of 200 cities, Modesto, number 147, Fresno, 152, Stockton, Salinas, Merced, Bakersfield, and Visalia, down near the bottom. Uh, these, I mean, this is the kind of issues we have to deal with here in the Central Valley. Just over the hill, of course, is affluence and you know the, the digital frontier of Silicon Valley. And here we are in the Central Valley, suffering with lots and lots of difficult social, political, economic issues. Um, so when I was here last time, I talked about multiculturalism. And Bill had asked me to come and talk about Will Kimlicka's book, uh, Contemporary Political Philosophy. And you read some of this stuff about multiculturalism. Quick review. Multiculturalism is both a word that's used as a descriptive claim that says we are multicultural because there are different people from different cultures. It's also used as a normative claim which says that that is good. Now, not everyone agrees that multiculturalism is a good thing. 
Uh, some people want to talk about assimilation. There's different ways of, of describing this. But the two different ways of understanding this term, I think, important to distinguish. The fact of the matter is the Central Valley is multicultural. One of the great and wonderful opportunities of teaching here is you get to work with students and faculty who come from all kinds of diverse backgrounds. It's super cool. I used to teach in Wisconsin before I came here, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where multicultural meant Lutheran and Catholic, basically. <laughs> Belgian and you know, Germanic or something. I mean, uh, I grew up in, in Northern California and coming back to California to look out at the classroom and actually hear the voices of the students here. It's so cool. Descriptively, the case is this is multicultural wonderland. Uh, whether or not that's a good thing is another issue. That's the, the philosophy question, is should we celebrate multiculturalism or is there something else, uh, assimilation or something like that? So uh, just uh, to remind you what we talked about when I was here last time, uh, Will Kimlicka explains and defends the multicultural vision. He's Canadian, which helps explain where he's coming from because Canada prides itself on its multilingual, uh, almost multinational approach to things. Maybe the same kind of framework could apply here in the Central Valley. And if you read Kimlicka, if you go back and check your notes. He's, an, he's a person who affirms the multicultural vision, says it's a good thing, a wonderful thing. Not easy, but something that we should aim for is a robust kind of multiculturalism. Okay, now the Central Valley, at least down at our end, one of the most prominent intellectuals is this uh, fellow, Victor Davis Hanson, who is an opponent of multiculturalism. So to present the other side, Victor Davis Hanson, who taught at Fresno State for a long time. He is from Selma, which is a small farming town near Fresno. He retired from Fresno State. Now he works at the Hoover Institute over at Stanford. And he has been a uh, strong and longtime arguer against the multicultural vision. He wrote this notorious or wonderful book, depending on your perspective, called Mexifornia. Notorious. <laughs> uh, some people hate him, some people love him. In Fresno, oddly enough, I, I, I write a column for the Fresno Bee. My column's published on Saturday. Victor Davis Hanson has a column on Sunday. And, you know, depending on who your friends are in town, like either Saturday paper is good or Sunday paper is good, <laughs> um, sort of depending on your opinions about me and Victor Hanson. <laughs> um, anyway, his. Hansen's vision is assimilationist. He says, he suggests that the multicultural, he calls it an agenda, the multicultural plan is wrongheaded because it keeps us divided and doesn't allow us to come together uh, and it doesn't encourage assimilation. As he says at the bottom of this quote from Mexifornia, unchecked illegal immigration and multiculturalism are a lethal mix. Kimlicka, of course, has a different view. He argues that multiculturalism is a good thing. More recently, that Mexifornia book was a decade or more ago. More recently, from this summer, just let me read this to you. This is Victor Hansen's view, uh, National Review. Multicultural societies have a poor record of keeping the peace between competing tribes. They usually end up mired in nihilistic and endemic violence. The only hope for history's rare multiracial, multiethnic, and multireligious nations is to adopt a common culture, one that artificially suppresses the natural instinct of humans to identify first with their particular tribe. His worry is that when we emphasize our differences, we're going to end up fighting each other in the long run. The multiculturalists, like Kimlicka, will say actually the recipe for social peace and toleration is to allow us to celebrate our differences and to not force us into a cookie cutter mold. The assimilationist agenda from that perspective is itself violent. And so the dialectic goes. Okay, so uh, Bill had asked me, um, what can philosophers contribute? And one of the things that we do uh, at least what we hope that we do, <laughs> is clarify concepts. So some conceptual analysis. Um, and when I teach this stuff, I spend a lot of time trying to clarify the isms and the ists. There are lots of them, and it's very complicated. Uh, you take a philosophy class, and by the end of the term, hopefully you have this vocabulary, 
And you also hopefully understand how complicated it is to make a good judgment about ethical, political, cultural reality. So here's several concepts. I'm not going to talk about any of these in any detail. But for example, the first row across the top, on the left, we have communism. On the far right, we have anarchism. And if you think about the history of those two things, they may actually form a circle. <laughs> so even the conceptual scheme is kind of difficult to formulate. Uh, along the bottom, these are different ways of conceiving and understanding national identity and conflicting cultural identity claims from communitarianism. I guess on the left, it can also be on the right, by the way, all the way over towards a kind of radical individualism that wants to suggest that individuals are distinguishable or separable from their communitarian basis, okay? This is all quite complicated. And one of the things I think we're good at as philosophers and humanists is to point out the complexity of being human. It's not easy to understand who and what we are. And given just this kind of brief schematic of political positions, then you dig into psychological, to economic, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, it's hard to make sense of the world and to make sense of ourselves. Um, how am I doing on time here? Okay. Uh, one one uh, recipe for common ground that I think is fruitful and successful is what I call modern liberalism associated with John Rawls, the, the project of basically the last half of the 20th century in American political philosophy. This idea claims that we can agree to disagree provided we discover points of overlapping consensus. And I think Jim Tweedio was even talking about this, oddly, in a different way. But there's, there's this idea. You called it overlapping durations or something. Um, the idea that we could agree to a certain framework of political, economic, cultural life, agree despite the fact that we're quite different. That fits with the multicultural agenda that Kim Licka was talking about. Uh, and certainly in the, the mainstream of um, 20th century political philosophy, this seems to be the prevailing idea. The idea of overlapping consensus that balances identity concerns, national community concerns, liberty, justice, and so on. It looks something like this if you want to schematize it. We have uh, different, differing uh, comprehensive schemes. This could be religious difference, cultural difference, linguistic difference, style of life difference, name your favorite difference. But somewhere, despite our differences, we're going to overlap. And where we overlap, that's where we can find a place to build consensus in terms of shared common ground for political life. Um, you're probably not surprised by this story. This was, this, again, the story of the last half of the 20th century is to try, to try to flesh this out, both in practice and theory. Um, I think, although I'm nervous these days with what's going on in the national political scene, I think that there's common ground in terms of our shared understanding of our founding documents, the founding legal documents of the country, the Constitution. Uh, I think the Constitution is a pretty good thing. <laughs> Not everyone agrees. Not everyone who's running for president has read the Constitution. Um, <laughs> but if we're going to have productive political life, we should have some shared notion of a, a common frame of reference, uh, both to talk about justice, equality, rights, culture, and so on. Okay. Um, so finally, let me head towards conclusion here in terms of what philosophers can offer and what humanity scholars can offer uh, to, to further this, to help build further consensus, to find common ground. One, we can clarify normative questions and understand what it means to talk about ethics and politics in a normative fashion, not merely as descriptive, but trying to actually evaluate these things and come up with suggestions uh, about what's good and what's just. We can look and demand for logic and consistency and critical thinking. We can challenge political and religious authorities, especially when they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> and when they say outrageous and unfair and untrue things. Uh, we can emphasize certain virtues that most of us believe are essential to leading a good life, including virtues like moderation, justice, courage, uh, wisdom, and so on. We can recognize and understand the limits of knowledge, both 
with a bit of self-consciousness about what we can get away with saying, what we can actually establish as true, and also understanding the genealogy, maybe it was Jason was talking about genealogy, understanding the background of, of our ideas and where they come from and how that imposes limits on them. We, especially philosophers, and I think most humanistic scholars, most humanity scholars, are very good at fostering dialogue. We like to do this in our classrooms. Uh, that, I believe, is productive for developing the common ground, because if we can exchange ideas in a civil fashion, wow, that's a great opportunity for developing overlapping consensus. And then finally, philosophers, I think, are especially good at that schematic analytic approach, which looks at differing claims and then can size them up against one another. So in philosophy land, we talk about moral dilemmas, we talk about competing conceptual schemes, and so on. My conclusion is, uh, how about this for a very naive and hopeful conclusion? If the world, if the Central Valley, if Modesto and Fresno were a little bit more philosophical, <laughs> if we paid more attention to the important role that the humanities plays uh, in the educational system, if we did all that, we'd be better off. Back to where I started with like the, the, the poverty issues and the social dysfunction and the cultural uh, disputes in California's Central Valley. Um, if we're going to solve those problems and bring people together, we've got to do better at the task of what philosophers do and what humanities scholars like all you here do. So I'm done. Thank you very much.